okay we do not have any question after this so i think uh, it, it it we are running 10 minutes late but then if you overshoot no, we'll cover up we'll cover up 15 minutes no. it doesn't matter i mean we don't have really anything after this it's nice to see so many people uh, from asrs dr sunil maria so many people and thanks to uh, our honorary secretary namrata sharma who has worked so very hard uh, hi dr varun uh, uh, and uh, you know got got us together on this uh, virtual platform so sunil if you permit i will uh, share my screen perfect okay uh, let me just let me know if it is visible and audible so that i can start right away is it uh, yeah, visible yeah, from my end okay okay uh, thanks uh, aius thanks dr namrata sharma and thanks all the people from asrs i'll be talking on a subject uh, you know uh, which is a very commonly performed uh, procedure and in fact uh, one third of uh, my vitreoretinal surgeries are diabetic vitreotomies you see at the onset uh, i would just like to have a disclaimer that all membranes in the retina do not require surgery you see the reason i am showing this upper right photograph is this patient uh, one night patient was uh, you know sent because this patient had uh, traction but as everybody would know this is predominantly a nasal traction not involving the macula the other thing i want to you know uh, uh, highlight here is that vitreous hemorrhage or the presence of trd or both do not call for any institution of anti vegf blindly because i see a lot of patients of uh, first attack vitreous hemorrhage people being injected with anti vegf especially in unlaser retina because you still have to be prepared for vitreoretinal surgery the reason i said these two are because a lot of referrals come for these two conditions you see this is the same lady who i am showing this is one eye right eye already lost so you have to be very very conservative conservative means if the patient is maintaining 6 12 vision in a diabetic eye believe me there is no rush to hurry diabetic uh, you know it may may look simple but uh, people know that uh, once you are inside you may sometimes end up with the uh, uh, not so desirable sequelae so we should follow up such patient intervene only if there is a macular trd so this was another patient who had had you see this is an obvious patient who requires surgery but what was done to this patient this patient was given avastin and then this patient of plpr again a nanite patient you show has rubus iridis was referred for vitreoretomy so this patient definitely i would agree requires vitreoretomy so the indication of vitreous surgery in diabetic uh, have evolved you see when we were residents the main indication was non resolving vitreous hemorrhage but now the main indication is a macular trd or a combined macular or rect trd and believe me with improvements of machinery and instrumentation the threshold of going inside is decreased now we no longer wait for a couple of months it is a vertical follow up and the visual demand of the patient so the threshold of mivs has decreased quite a bit and the other indication which has been added for diabetic mivs is a non responsive macular edema also so i'll just share a couple of videos here this is a patient who had a bilateral vitreous hemorrhage this was a relatively simpler looking uh, vitreotomy and uh, you see the cause of vitreous hemorrhage was uh, this massive nvd here which was angry looking so after doing core vitreotomy we just truncated this it is very important to you know uh, i normally do it at the uh, slight slight distance from the optic nerve head because if any even if it bleeds the clot itself can form and i don't need need to dislodge then uh, you know with the same instrument uh, you know you clear uh, majority of the vitreous hemorrhage and even the loose blood which is there can be aspirated with the help of this so this is the loose blood being aspirated the macula looks pretty good and at the end of it you start doing laser and i still believe laser laser and laser is the uh, procedure which ultimately in the long run for couple of decades is going to be the savior and in case you do not do laser properly and do a half hearted laser or a or a laser which is you know uh, not occupying all the quadrants i normally would go parallel to the blood vessel and you know the surgery took actually around 7 8 minutes but the laser took 10 15 minutes because i am very fond of lasering parallel to the blood vessel not having any escape areas and do a complete complete scatter laser photocoagulation as is shown here because this patient if you do not do laser properly and if you you know keep injecting uh, anti vegfs you see this is the end of surgery 
a very nicely laser retina, and this patient does not require any gas also. We just injected air and came out. This was the end result of this patient. This is one first post-op day, and this was another patient who had a similar result. This is a series of videos from milder to severe diabetic vitretomies, what all of you also do. So we begin with a core vitretomy here as, a, and you see, I do not believe in the concept of inside out or outside in approach. Basic thing is wherever you find cleavage, because the, the bug primarily is a posterior vitreous, which is difficult to, you know, in, uh, to detach. And because there are multiple fibrovascular attachments in a diabetic patient. So what we are doing here is a, a core vitretomy, trying to get closer to the retina, trying to identify the hyaloid. Now we have identified the hyaloid, made a hole, and now this loose blood behind the hyaloid will, uh, you know, start in coming out from here. We try to take out this, whatever blood comes out. And then once this opening is made in the hyaloid, try to go all around 360 degree so that you can actually truncate the entire uh, cone here. And you find this loose, this, this uh, firm attachments to the, uh, obtain of area, trim that area. And there may be some ooze as is there. Do not leave behind this ooze for a long time. Because this can sometimes, you know, become a difficult proposition at the end of it. So if you uh, allow this blood to accumulate for a long time, this may cause uh, issues later on and become a membrane itself. This is a relatively simpler, you know, uh, attachment on the obtaining of head, which could be peeled. But believe me, all membranes are not easy to peel uh, in these patients. So we did an air flow exchange after this, after most of the traction was relieved. Macula, although there are exudates, but looks uh, not so bad. So this was the end of this patient's surgery. This was a patient who had had uh, diabetic maculoedema, resistant to 19 injections. And typically we do a core vitretomy with triamcillolone and forming two islands of uh, crystals. You peel off the, you know, hyaloid uh, in this patient. And since the lens was not very clear, we called in the catheter surgeon who did a good job to, you know, remove this lens. We went in again to complete the vitrectomy. And at this point of time, under air, we injected the trypan blue dye to identify the, uh, the membrane, which was causing the traction. This is the epidural membrane. And the best instrument which I use is a 25 gauge MVR blade. And after the edge is identified, we go ahead with the Accard forceps and uh, peel this membrane. Since the retina was not looking very good, I injected the third uh, uh, dye, which is the BBG dye, also known as blue ICG, which selectively stains the ILM. And in this particular patient, we, we, we peeled off the ILM also. Believe me, not in all patients, uh, you know, we go ahead and peel the ILM. So uh, this was the ILM surgery being done in this patient. And that was the end of the surgery in this patient. So this was another diabetic patient. After doing, uh, you know, separating a lot of membranes, we found in the nasal part, this was a very tough looking, uh, uh, you know, cord-like structure. So if you do a traction test, whether it is easily coming without any uh, structural or, uh, or blood damage to the retina, and uh, you what I call a traction kind of test. And this uh, fortunately came off. Then we trimmed this uh, very hard looking uh, cord-like structure, then diathermized it and truncated till the, till the area it was possible. We didn't uh, trim it till the base. This is the diathermy being used in the same. And this blood, loose blood, which was there was taken out. This was another, uh, you know, diabetic patient wherein uh, we did the vitrectomy. We separated most of the membranes, but there was this, uh, you know, membrane which was on the uh, nasal side. This was the left eye, which was I was operating. Somehow the manipulation was difficult. So we do a positional kind of vitrectomy. The inferior infrotemporal port, which is conventionally the uh, infusion port, I made it upper nasal, then shifted my, uh, you know, uh, the you know, stool for the surgery and worked from the temporal side. So what was uh, nasal initially now became uh, inferior for me, relatively easier to manipulate. Although you have to do very slow kind of maneuvers because you don't want to cause any iatrogenic issues in this. And this was the nasal membrane, which uh, uh, got ultimately separated from the retina. And then again, as I said, 
the main job. Then we again came back to the previous ports only and ultimately ended the surgery with a lot of laser and, and, and filled up the eye with gas. So this was another patient, relatively young patient, IDDM patient, had florid kind of retinopathy. You see, this was actually combined REC plus uh, fractional RD. And you see the toughness of the membranes. This was the REC component here. And uh, for a long time, could not see the plane. What I did was I created a mini PVD, just, uh, just slightly pulled with the help of forceps. Se aim was to separate it from the optic nerve head slightly, so as to find a small plane and insinuate the instrument. So now comes the cutter. Now you can insinuate this between the healthy or, or the normal retina or, and, the, and this bad membrane here. And then did uh, some segmentation work here. Because there are multiple fibrovascular attachments, aim was to go in between. Then used uh, you know, this uh, you know uh, separator L by Elcon, and then again with this cutter, trying to find plane in between the two uh, bullae of the detached retina. It has to be slow, patient. Aim is not to cause uh, you know breaks. Aim is not to cause bleeding as far as possible. This is, uh, you know, then I injected after their segmented areas, you know, were there all 360 degrees, injected PFCL just to know where are we now. So this was with the PFCL, you could see segmented. Uh, at this stage, after, you know, uh, segmenting some more membranes and, uh, you know, delineating planes, I thought it's better to now switch to bimanual because there are a lot of uh, traction areas on the posterior pole. So with forceps in left hand and, uh, you know, this curved scissor, which is uh, one of my favorite instruments in uh, bimanual surgery, uh, the advantage of this bimanual is the precision. You see, you just lift that area slightly and go underneath it, and this fibrovascular pegs of tissue can be precisely cut. The advantage is that apart from precision, bleeding also is less because you pull less in such. And once you have separated this, then you, you know, bring in the cutter again and uh, finally diathermize the remnant stumps. And at the end of it, uh, do airflow exchange, remove this PFCL bubble. I, in this patient, I had to put in silicone oil. There were, uh, uh, you know, two, three areas of uh, retinal tissue uh, where retinotomy was done. And finally, ended up with a lot of laser in this patient. Laser, laser, and laser is the ultimate savior. So bimanual surgery, I feel, is even in the era of 25 only 7 gauge, is very helpful in especially difficult dissections, primarily because to me it feels it adds precision and less complications and better hemostasis and also reduce exchange of instrumentation, reduces surgical time. So this was the end result of this patient, which I have a long follow-up actually. And this, uh, you know, it. Uh, she was initially hesitant because vision was very good. And finally, once we did surgery, uh, this was the end result. This was the result in the other eye of the same patient. This was another patient who had had uh, this uh, bimanual surgery done. You see, this is the pre-operative picture. This is the post-operative picture. And this is the fundus picture, uh, pre-operatively right eye. Another patient, this is the uh, same patient post-operatively. Couple of more patients, uh, where this bimanual surgery has really helped me is these are both eyes of the same patient pre and post operatively. Fortunately, because disc and macula was good, so therefore the visual result also was good in this particular patient. This was the same patient which I started with the first slide. That patient was referred for rear surgery. This patient we could get a six by eighteen kind of vision with regression of rubiosis and a lot of laser as you see. Done. So just to conclude, diabetic vitrectomy is not a simple procedure. No two diabetic vitrectomy are the same. And normally I would post a diabetic vitrectomy at the last, one of the last case because uh, it's quite unpredictable. And PVD is uh, generally difficult in a diabetic because of the multiple tenacious vascular attachments. And they are tenacious, so they tend to cause break. And since they're vascular, they tend to bleed. So you have to, the answer is you should work slowly. Do not pull too much and do more of segmentation and delamination. And believe me, with faster, newer probes, with the port being closer to the tip, uh, the use of scissors also has decreased, but I do, uh, you know, uh, resort to bimanual surgery sometimes. 
and better machines and better you know uh, machine uh, probes and this thing has made the job easier and if the if the fibers of front is angry looking i do not hesitate to use pre operative anti vegf prior to uh, doing a diabetic procedure thank you very much uh, for listening i'll just uh, stop sharing my screen and if there are any questions i will will love to answer them thanks a lot for a wonderful presentation as always so